Hello, personal productivity enthusiasts and community. Welcome to Anything But Idle, the productivity news podcast. I'm Ray Sidney Smith. And I'm Augusto Pinot. And we're your hosts for Anything But Idle. This is episode 18, and we're recording this on August 13th, 2020. Each week, we cover the productivity news headlines of the week, so you know what's going on in the current research, services, products, tools, and more in the world of personal productivity. With that, let's get into our headlines. Augusto, we have some COVID-19 news. Facebook decide to continue working from home until at least July 2021. That is our first news. And then Atlassian tell employees that they can work from home forever. So they changed their policy, and now you can work from home indefinitely. And the third news we have for COVID-19 is not as happy news as Mozilla lays off 250 of their employees due to COVID-19. You know, that's 250. It is a significant percentage of the people. We're talking about 25% of the Mozilla employees. So that's the, the sad news of, of the weeks. Yeah, they're closing their Taiwanese office. And uh, if you all don't know this, Mozilla is doing some really foundational work in terms of uh, data privacy and protecting all of us on the web. So if you can, donate to the Mozilla Foundation. So what's our first story in the Apple ecosystem? You know, the first story is related to Fantastical. Fantastical, it's a Power calendar application, and they just released their new family subscription. So it used to be that you get the single user subscription for four ninety nine a month, and now if you have more than one person, families in there, you can now go to the family subscription for seven ninety nine a month. I don't know. I think we are going to we are getting close to hitting subscription fatigue uh, from people. You know, I understand why the model changed, and I think for software companies, it's going to get soon to start the time where let me buy the software again fine charge me whatever you're going to charge me but let me buy the software this subscription thing it's i don't know where where how far is going to go so right i think the old model was if you pay a particular amount you own it for as long as there wasn't a major upgrade and then you would pay for the next major upgrade and for some reason developers went to this monthly plan because it made them more money and it was a more stable form of income, which makes sense. But you're right. At some point, people get kind of fatigued, uh, stressed in terms of, of all of the various subscriptions that they have to pay for. So next up, Apple is uh, putting out their first public beta of the Apple Watch OS 7. And so public beta, beta users public beta users now have uh, their hands on watchOS 7. Uh, what's What are some of the major updates in the watchOS 7 space? They've got a new sleep tracking feature. What else is coming up? Well, they have the wash your hands. They, they really make a lot of changes into what is coming. The, the watchOS is limited to Series 3, 4, and 5. They are... Apple has finally decided not to bring that or make it compatible with their Apple Watch Series 1 and 2. Uh, But the biggest improvements are on the maps. You know, the cyclists now can get uh, much better maps. They... uh, Obviously, the slip tracking feature, it is a big deal. So it's going to see. I I have read good things about the new... um, public beta and we need to wait it's coming it's coming soon and fast uh the rumor says that they will be here by the end of september so let's see what happened with that continuing on with our apple news of the week uh apple has just released ios 13.6.1 as well as ipad os 13.6.1 and so this continues from uh, their July release of 13.6 and uh, the the release of Car Key, which was which is Apple's version of a digital key for uh, supported vehicles to be able to lock, unlock, and start them. What else has come in 13.6.1? It's really this is an update mostly designed to fix bugs more than introduce anything new. So there is a couple of issues with system data files that don't get deleted and when the storage. It's low, and there is issues on some of the newer devices where the thermal management, it's causing the screen to look green. So hopefully this fixed those two things. There is a couple more minor things, but really those are the two main big issues. 
Yeah, I've had a couple of clients with the green tint situation come up and uh, resolving it just by having Apple roll it back. So I'm glad to see them fixing it in 13.6.1. All right, so Google Maps uh, has now gotten an upgrade on Apple CarPlay and on the Apple Watch OS. So on Monday, uh, Google announced that they would be improving the Google Maps on those two platforms. Google Maps will be available in the CarPlay dashboard. And so there on the home screen, you can see you're driving along, you'll be able to see calendar appointments and you'll be able to see what music you're playing all alongside the directions. Uh, so turn by turn directions will then um, be available. That is also coming to the Apple Watch. So you'll have turn by turn directions showing up on your Apple Watch. I already currently experience that on my uh, you know, my Wear OS uh, device. It's really nice to be able to just look at your wrist and be able to see where the next turn is upcoming and the distance and so on and so forth. So glad to see Google bringing that to the watchOS uh, platform. And with that, we have reached our halfway point in the headlines. And so that means a word from our sponsor this week, Zarvana at Zarvana.com. As a young analyst at a leading strategy and management consulting firm, I experienced what ambitious professionals experience every week. I had a strong desire to get promoted as quickly as I could, and I wanted to take on exciting side projects, and I wanted to do all of that while spending less time at work so my life outside of work wasn't limited to exhaustion and recovery. My observations of my coworkers told me this wasn't possible, but I knew there had to be a way. I began to research and experiment, and in two to three months, I had reduced the hours I was working by over 15% while placing myself on the path to a faster-than-average promotion. My success led to the creation of Zarvana, a tool designed to give you the edge at work and in life. It combines a diagnostic, abbreviated courses, and a habit tracker into a single application to enable you to get the most out of your time in just minutes per week. You can start by taking the Time Finder Diagnostic to find out how many of our 150 time-saving behaviors you're currently doing. And we're back. What's our next headline, Augusto? Inside Notion's Global Expansion Plan, and it's an article from David Pierce talking about the, the expansion plan for Notion. And as we know, Notion is the productivity tool. It's been making real noise. They just get a second funding in April. I'm not sure... Some of the people I know who use Notion will love the fact that the article is placed by calling them uh, finicky adopters, but hey, <laughs> it's what it is. This is a, a very interesting application. As I've frequently said, you know, these applications that are always bandied about as being kind of ne the next great thing, uh, you know, we've said that about many applications and we just don't know, you know, this is, uh, this is getting notoriety. It is a, it is hopefully going to become a very powerful software, uh, but it is very cloud centric. And uh, as I've seen with other applications that have lacked, uh, you know, strong mobile application and strong desktop application functionality across platforms, uh, it, struggle, it struggles, you know, it, it's just gonna struggle. Uh, so I, I get what they're doing. It's gonna take them time and I hope they do well, I really do. Uh, but it's just gonna take time before we see uh, the ultimate uh, kind of outcome of whether or not they'll survive in this market. But they've got a lot of uh, venture capital, so uh, they've got a, a long runway uh, to kind of figure that out. And so we shall see. We will, we will keep you posted. Okay, next up is uh, an application that is kind of a competitor to what we talked about a few episodes back when we talked about Camo by a company called Reincubate. And so what Camo does is it turns your iOS or iPadOS device into a webcam uh, by connecting them physically. Well, this new company, NeuralCam Live, this new software, NeuralCam Live, uses machine learning to turn your iPhone into a smart computer webcam. And in essence, it does all of these back of the house algorithmic work to make you look good on camera. And so you can take an older iPhone and other kinds of things and really help you do a video stream, a, a live stream uh, with uh, pretty high fidelity. I'm curious to see uh, who uses it, how it works for people. Uh, I know that I've been using an, an audio 
filtering software and audio enhancing software for you know on my on my desktop for meetings and it's just better than the built-in you know noise canceling and noise filtering uh, software that are out there and uh, to see Neuralcam Live come on, I'm, I'm just curious to see how it will work in line with those kinds of other software. The next news is Dropbox finally launches their password manager, File Vault, and the backup across the Macs. And we mentioned here in the show when they were into the beta testing for this, and now it's finally out. So it's a, I think it's a good step for People. Dropbox is on a lot of computers. It is on a lot of people. And managing passwords and computer backups is something people don't do naturally. So I think giving this option to the people, it is going to be interesting for people. Right. And so the, the flip side to this, just kind of the way in which I view it is pretty much akin to you, which I'm, I'm glad Dropbox has done this, even though a lot of the criticism that has been seen online is, do we need another password manager? Is Dropbox really the right company to be doing, uh, you know, security in that sense, yada, 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 right? Um, I totally get the criticisms and I think they're valid. But at the same time, there are so many people out there who are using password one, two, three, or they're using the same password for all of their important accounts. And if this just brings some level of, of notoriety, some level of, of awareness to folks that they need to be using password managers where they have long passwords that are utilizing not just numbers and letters so that they can keep those passwords in check, I think is a good thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see Dropbox doing this, even though, you know, it'll be a, a cold day in... Uh, <laughs> you know, on the equator when I uh, decide to use Dropbox to be my password manager. But if you're in that ecosystem and you're using it, you know, it's better than uh, password one, two, three. Now we get to shift ourselves over to some uh, some Google news in the Googleverse. First up, we have Fossil out with their Gen 5 Wear OS smartwatches, and they have added a wellness app uh, which will allow some really interesting health features. So uh, it will be doing sleep tracking. Uh, they'll be doing measuring of uh, cardio type workouts, like if you're going for a run or those kinds of things. Uh, you can track your uh, VO2 max levels and uh, score your endurance workouts. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. The wellness app uh, also gives some other you know minor features. I'm just interested to see how Fossil takes these Gen 5 smartwatches into kind of their next generation of health features, especially since they're, you know, they're the everyday person type smartwatches, if there is an everyday version of a, uh, of a smartwatch. And um, I have an aging smartwatch, a, a, a Wear OS watch, and I'm in the market for a new one, but I'm really holding out for the Google Pixel watch if it ever comes. And so I'm just looking at all the various options that are out there and thinking, well, maybe I'm just going to get the battery refreshed on my current watch and wait. The smartwatch world is really, really interesting because it is a world that is hard to explain. And I have always tell people, people ask me, okay, well, do you recommend the, a, a smartwatch or the Apple watch? And I always said, well, the problem is, in my experience, they don't do anything that you say is this is the reason to buy it. It is really a series of really tiny and small things that together make the experience of the watch really, really interesting. You know, one. So being adding those wellness to the to the low end or to the entry level of the smartwatches, I think is really, really interesting. And it may introduce people into tracking some of these health features. You know, I recently began tracking that I have never done before meditation on mine. I have meditated for many years, but I have never tracked it. So I never knew how long it is or how long it's not. Now I'm tracking it in the watch. And it's really make a difference on my practice because now I can know how many hours have that really happened instead of how many hours I think it happened. So next up, we have Android 11 is adding autofill passwords uh, using 
Gboard. So Gboard is the application that you can install on Android devices as well as on Chrome OS, and it gives you a whole bunch of really great features. And now we are in a state where Google and Android feel strong enough about adding some new features there, like connecting your autofill functionality into the Gboard application. So that's really the major component being added in this particular um, version, uh, this particular update within Android 11. And we'll see obviously more upgrades and additions to Android 11 as they make their way through the, the beta channels and uh, preview channels toward release. Well, the next news is really, really interesting for me. Google turns their Android phones into an earthquake detection network. I don't live in California anymore, but I used to live in Los Angeles. And yes, you get them and you never know when they come. You don't know. So having this little thing, you know, that is going to alert you, hey, phones are surrounding you, are experiencing this, is coming to you, drop, cover, and and be hold. So when it gets, I think it is an incredibly clever way of use technology. And I hope it's going to translate into saving life all around the world. Fantastic. It's just, it's wonderful to see how technology can be utilized in these ways that we didn't first think about. But now that we all have computers with a bunch of sensors built into it in our pockets, there is a uh, an ongoing data privacy and data protection issue, but there's also this massive ability to take those data points and, as you said, save lives and make people healthier and live uh, better lives. Next up, talking about a better life, is better sleep. Google is bringing bedtime wellness to the non-Pixel. They're bringing those to the non-Pixel world. So if you are already on the Pixel line of phones, you had the bedtime mode uh, on your Android device. Now, if you have uh, Android 6, which is Marshmallow or later, Android is rolling that out to all other Android phones. Uh, so that is a, a really great feature. Uh, it basically limits the number of uh, visual notifications. I think it actually grays out the screen. So it goes to kind of a gray scale and it does a bunch of other little features that help you kind of get ready for bedtime. And it's within the digital well-being uh, functions inside of the clock app. So good on Google for um, finally scaling that out from the exclusive pixel features to the rest of the world. And with that, that brings us to the end of our headlines this week and onward to the Science of Productivity segment with Matt Plummer from Zervana. The Science of Productivity segment brings you scientific insights you can trust into how to accomplish your goals faster. In this week's segment, I want to share research that unpacks whether tracking data on yourself will boost your productivity. People began tracking data on themselves using large, unwieldy computers as early as the 1970s in hopes of, quote, gaining knowledge through numbers. In the last 15 years, though, this trend has exploded, popularized at least in part by the technology magazine Wire beginning in 2007. Today, we can track an incredible amount of data on our lives, from health data using devices like the Fitbit or the Apple Watch, to how we spend our time using applications like Rescue Time. While the ability to collect and analyze such data has increased, the question still remains, does it actually make us better and more productive, particularly in the work context? Researchers from Stanford set out to answer this question by placing RFID tracking technology on workers in a garment factory in India. To remove the effect of incentives on performance, the researchers instituted these RFID tags without linking them to any performance-based incentives for the workers. You know, basically they just tracked the data and made it visible to the employees themselves. And just tracking the data in this way increased the productivity of the workers by over 8%, but only for some workers. Productivity rose by this margin for workers completing simple tasks. However, for workers completing complex tasks, productivity dropped by 5% or more. Quantification works when the task is simple because we are convinced that the data meaningfully represents the goal we are trying to achieve. However, for complex tasks, the data doesn't represent the true goal. 
causing the tracking and the displaying of such data to be distracting and ultimately demotivating. The key takeaway is that if you want to quantify the output of your work, be sure that the work is simple enough that one or a few data points will accurately represent it. Otherwise, it will likely have the opposite effect. And thanks to Matt Plummer from Zervana for his Science of Productivity segment. And now for the new tools of the week. Augusto and I come across many personal development, time, task, project management, and productivity collaboration tools and services each week. Some we use, and some are really cool. And so in this segment, new tools of the week, we each bring you a tool we think you might like. And so first tool of the week is a tool called Signature Email. And what Signature Email is, or Signature.email, because that is the uh, TLD, the top level domain, dot email. So signature.email. What it does is it generates email signatures as its name implies. And so this particular uh, developer uh, started this as kind of a side hustle and uh, his name is Jesse Sutherland out of, out of Minneapolis. And he's created this uh, tool that in essence is a visual drag and drop editor. It creates your email signatures and you can just very, very quickly create uh, nicely branded email signatures. Now, if it's just you as an individual, it's free, uh, but the uh, the real way that he makes money is for teams and organizations who want to manage consistent branding for their organization. Uh, I know that, you know, having run a company with many people in it, uh, you know, having to manage email signatures every time someone comes, every time, you know, every, every time you onboard someone new, every time someone changes a phone number or an email address or, you know, someone's title changes, that needs to be done across the board. And that can be very, you know, time consuming. So with a tool like this, you can actually just save all that time by having this built-in tool where people can generate email signatures on the fly, update information, and you have consistency across the organization. So very, very cool to, uh, to kind of check out the signature.email. What is your new tool of the week, Augusto? My new tool of the week, it's not necessarily new, but it's called, it's called Set App, and it's a service that you pay a monthly fee. That You know, you can pay $9.99 if you go on the monthly, uh, $8.99 if you go in the annual plan, but allows you then to access and download apps for, it used to be only Mac OS, now it's Mac OS and iOS, so you can use apps as Ulysses, as ToDo, as MyNote, and among others, okay? And you pay just, instead of paying multiple subscriptions, one from MyNote, one from Ulysses, one from ToDo, you just pay this $9.99 and you can basically go all you can eat on all these apps. Uh, there, the reason I'm bringing this app this week is because they just add the iOS to the mixture. So you, for the same price, you can now get them in the Mac as well as on the iOS. And hey, that make it really, really interesting. You know, you pay for many of these apps four bucks or, or five bucks a month. So now if you get two of the, two of their list, now you can you know, start making it cheaper for you. So. And our featured story of the week is that Microsoft has released the Surface Duo foldable phone. Oh, you are going to put me in record that this that I push for for making this a feature in of the week. Thank you. This is a. It's not a secret that I believe that the Surface line of product from Microsoft has been a really well done hardware base. I think the form factor that they did is really interesting. When you open it, gets around 7.9 inches. That is the the size of an Apple an Apple iPad Mini. So even that this phone is powered by Android, that is again something really interesting. Microsoft, this is the first time, at least that I'm really aware, that they are going to put a different hardware inside of their uh, different software inside of their hardware. So they are going to go with Android for this phone and it's going to be available on September 10. And it brings Samsung to to the game. You know, so if you want to go high end on Android, you need to go Pixel or you go or you go Samsung. And I think bringing a new player 
Microsoft, who has been done a really good job with their hardware on the Surface line. It is going to be really interesting for the high-end phones in Android. Yeah, so this is a whopping $1,399 USD for the Surface Duo phone. Uh, as you said, it's Android powered. Uh, it has a Snapdragon from Qualcomm 855 processor, uh, six gigabytes of RAM, which is pretty decent. And it starts at 128 gigabytes for storage. You can go up to a 256 gigabyte uh, model. Uh, so almost a quarter, a little more than a quarter terabyte. Uh, and um, and that's going to come at $1,500. So there are two 5.6 inch AMOLED screens, uh, and as its name implies, that folds over into, uh, you know, into half the size of the two 5.6 inch screens. Um, so they form together a 1.8 inch screen or 1.8 inch display, and it does have a hinge in the middle. So you're, you know, there is a line down the center when you're looking at it. Um, it's roughly half a pound, so 250 grams. So that is heavier um, than most of our phones out there. But, you know, it's a it's a pretty solid device. I'm really looking forward to finding uh, someone who has one to play with because uh, I'm I'm just really curious how this form factor is going to work. Uh, you know, when you have a screen on the top and something on the bottom where you can have a keyboard or have other another application open where you are interacting and engaging with that application uh, either top to bottom or side to side. I, I see myself using this in the sense of having information above and data below so that I'm able to actually uh, input data from some other source. So just like I would you know, use kind of task view and split view in and on the desktop, I would use that in the the duo, the duo environment as well. I'm I'm really curious to see how this will work. I'm I'm not sure that this device is for me necessarily, but I could see that if I were again going back to the Z Fold when we were talking about that with with Samsung, if I were a road warrior and I was on the road all the time and I wanted a really nice device to be able to you know fit in my pocket, but at the same time open up and have a bigger richer uh, screen experience, this is a pretty nice device. And where the Z Fold is going to be over two grand, this is coming in under 1500. So you're going to save yourself uh, half a grand in that. Now, as Augusto said, it's coming for pre order on uh, on September 10th, and it'll be available at the Microsoft Store, at least the ones that are left. I'm going to guess the Microsoft Store online. AT&T and Best Buy will have them, and you'll have uh, two options, the T-Mobile and Verizon Networks uh, versions that will be uh, on the unlocked model. And I think you, you made a good point in there. You know, I when I'm going to meetings, or when I used to go to meetings before this pandemic thing, my device of choice to these meetings was the iPad mini. For a person who goes into meetings often, that was just to show this will be the perfect device to bring instead of the computer. Just bring that thing, expand it, connect it, do your presentation, do your thing, show what you need to do with a really, put it in your pocket and leave. And I think that is going to bring for those people who do that for a living. And there is a lot of people who do that for a living, a really, really fantastic device on their pocket. And so with that, that brings us to the close of our episode, minus a couple of notes. One, if we missed a story, please feel free to reach out to us via our contact page at anythingbutidle.com. You can also tweet and or DM us on Twitter at anything but idle. You'll notice in future episodes, we're, we're limiting the number of stories in the episode for time. And so we now have a section on the sh in the show notes called extras. In the extras are other stories, other headlines that we didn't cover, but we figured you'd wanna know about that was news that happened this week. So go check out the extras, those headlines there in the show notes on the episode page, which again is at anythingbutidle.com. And you can also on anythingbutidle.com find our social media links. So if you want to follow us on social media, find us there. If you can, please leave a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or whatever your favorite podcast app is if it allows for you to give a rating or review. Thank you for for uh, helping us grow the Anything But Idle productivity listening audience. And finally, 
Thanks for listening to Anything But Idle, the Productivity News Podcast. Until next time, here's to your productive life.